Welcome to the TAE 40116 support session that we're running today. You're welcome to um, download the um, audio file that we're about to put together now as we do this support session and watch the um, content in any sort of time frames that you like. So you don't have to watch the whole lot in one session. You can certainly chop it up into little five minute easy parts and just come back and um, record the amount of time that you've watched and then start from there again. So I welcome you today. Thank you for joining us and we're now going to progress through this um, topic. It's focused today on designing and developing learning programs. So this is one of the initial steps that uh, is learned during the um, commencement of your certificate for in training and assessment. The first um, summary that we'll quickly have a look at is really what's contained in this topic. So this is about designing and developing learning programs. And the four key topics that we're going to be covering are defining the parameters of the learning program, working within um, the VET policy framework, and VET um, stands for Vocational Education and Training. So it's really understanding the industry that sits behind this um, very important sector within the education system of Australia. Then we're going to talk about the process for developing program content and designing the structure of your learning program. So when we start to dig into the details of what's involved to show what competence looks like for this particular topic, there are some performance criteria. I'm not going to go through them in detail now, but once we've finished this session, you'll certainly be able to review the unit of competency and you'll also be able to have a look at what the assessment requirements are separately to this um, recording. So I guess really the first place to start is to really understand who's who in the vet zoo. So there's some really specific um, helpful websites that I'm going to direct you to as part of the content for this topic. So I'm going to tab between them um, as we go through, but I do suggest um, saving them or bookmarking them within your web browser because some of them particularly you'll be going back to many, many times during your training and assessment um, strategy development. So with the first part, I'll just mention here that whenever you see this little symbol, which is a bookmark symbol into your favourites, then certainly I would recommend stopping the video or the audio playing and then going to the website that's mentioned and then saving it and having a good look around the website. So rather than just watching the, um, the video that uh, is on your screen now, I think it's often about really making sure that you're able to do a bit of exploration on your own about, around some of these websites. So the first one we're going to is um, a big portal that contains a whole lot of stuff on the VET sector and it's called the VET Knowledge Bank. I'm just going to tab across to that one and we'll open it up here. So this is the URL to access this one. Again, I'd recommend stopping the video now until you've been able to find the actual website itself. So the Vet Knowledge Bank has been put together largely by an organisation that relates specifically to the data um, that sits behind everything to do with the vet sector. And um, quite often you'll find that um, there's a need to look up an acronym and I'm very, very guilty as a TAE trainer of just rattling off using different acronyms and things like that. So one of the first things I'll mention in here is that there is a glossary of VET terms. So if you don't know what the terminology is when we say RTO, you can just click through the alphabetical part here and it'll tell you that RTO stands for Registered Training Organisation. If you'd like more information on what that is all about, then you can just click on the um, definition page here. So it will tell you that registered training organisations are accredited by um, an organisation called ASQA, which is the Australian Skills Quality Authority, or sometimes if you're in Victoria and WA, it could be a state authority. So these organisations are given an accreditation um, um, to deliver nationally accredited training and um, assessment programs and we'll be talking a whole lot more on that but it's really just to show you that there is a whole lot of information that you can get from this one particular area here. 
there's certainly um, a, a whole section we're going to go through in a minute called getting to know vet and that gives you a really good single page summary of all the different organizations and authorities that function within the vet sector there's um, for those of you who are involved in the policy side of things it'll give you the last 20 years worth of policies um, and there's also governance about who it is that regulates the vet sector there's further reading there's um, lots of really good resources in here and there's a whole section on the history of vet and the different documents that go through the evolution of the last 20 years so I think what we'll probably do now is start with the getting to know vet page so within this sector, this is a live um, diagram which talks through, I guess, all the different components of the vet sector. And the good thing about it is that quite a few of them are live links. So if you um, didn't know what a group training organisation was, um, or if you wanted to look up the details of who might be um, an enterprise registered training organisation, you can just click directly through to a lot of the websites that sit behind these different topics. So if we start from the top, for example, we talk through who are the different vet consumers. So when we talk about a vet program, and we've mentioned previously that it's a nationally accredited program, what we're talking about there is, is a certificate course in a lot of cases. So um, these days, a lot of that um, education can often start in the school system. So you may or may not have come across um, uh, kids from school who are in maybe year 10, 11 or 12 who are now getting into the workforce through doing a certificate course that involves working within the workforce as part of that. So school-based traineeships are quite popular these days. And that just means that people who are, or students at school who are not necessarily looking to go through to a university pathway for their next form of education can be really starting to bridge that gap between school and um, the workforce. So that's um, one of our first VET consumers. Then you've got post-secondary students. Um, so these are the kids from school who've left school and are not really quite certain exactly what pathway they're going on. Quite often they'll go and do some sort of training to facilitate them getting into the workforce. Then you've got probably the largest part of the VET consumers section, which is really your industry and employers and employees. So this is where people join an organisation and then as part of their training, they need to do some sort of qualification to ensure that they have a consistency of standard about their workplace tasks. So if you went and worked in a restaurant, you might be doing a hospitality um, qualification. Or if you go and work in a dance studio, you might be doing a dance qualification and there's lots and lots and lots of different options there for those sort of things and then you've got the last one here which is our NEET so this is for people that are not currently in education employment or training who are just doing um, a, some sort of nationally accredited certificate for pleasure or for potential change to move into a different industry perhaps so for all of these different vet consumers, there are lots of different websites that provide information for them. So for example, My Skills is really something that um, students or parents could look at and it will give you lots of different information about um, uh, where to go to find details about the different qualifications that are available up there. So you've got lots of different search fields here for that. Again, my future is more to do with um, post-school. Then you've got um, each individual state and territory will have their own advisory sites. You've got organisations that um, help people get into the workforce. You've got youth programs and then this one here, which is the USI website. So this is really um, a new initiative since 2015 where um, a unique student identifier is given to people doing nationally registered qualifications or units from those programs where they, it's like a Medicare card really for the education sector. So every time um, a course is, uh, you're enrolled in a course, then your data is fed through to this organisation and they will compile reports and things for the government. But it's a great service really for um, both employers and people who've done training to be able to get copies of what 
um, they have completed without having to go back to the original training organisation. So if you don't know whether you have a USI already, you can just click on the link there and that will take you to an option to be able to have it sent through to your mobile or your email. If you've done some training since 2015, you can access a copy of the transcript and other RTOs are required to um, acknowledge that if, if you provide that transcript from this website. So it's quite a new initiative that's really helpful. Then it talks about the pathway. So these are all the different journeys that people can go on to obtaining some sort of nationally recognised qualification. So you've got different training products. And by training product, we're talking about things called training packages, accredited courses, some sort of industry certification. And these are all sitting under what we call the Australian Qualifications Framework. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but it's essentially a framework that says there are 10 levels of education and that bridges across vocational education and higher ed. So you start off with a certificate one and in the vet sector, you can go all the way up to an associate degree. But once you get to that level seven area, you can transition into what's called the higher education system and that would um, have a slightly different name. So we're talking about a bachelor degree or an honours or a grad cert or a grad dip or a master's or a doctorate. So they're essentially the 10 levels of education and we'll be talking a bit more about the AQF shortly. But again, you can click on the link there and go through and do some um, reading on that um, yourself. Then it talks about how, who are the providers that provide the vocational education and training programs. So we've mentioned already uh, registered training organisations, but there are many forms of those. So you can have community education providers, sometimes they're called ACE colleges, adult community education colleges. You can have enterprise providers. So these are registered training organisations that are the employer. So they only um, become accredited as an RTO so that they can offer accredited training to their employees. They don't go out and offer it to people who are not employed by them. Then you've got group training organisations where the RTO actually employs usually apprentices and they will go out to um, employers who perhaps can't take on employees of any great volume for um, committed periods of time and they will subcontract them out. So if you're in the construction industry, it's quite a common thing for you to be employed by a group training organisation who then finds you work to do out in the construction industry through different employers. You've got private training providers. So these are the non-university, non-school, non-TAFE um, RTOs. You've got secondary schools, quite a few of whom are actually registered as registered training organisations in their own right, as well as being high schools. Then you've got TAFE Institute. So this is the government form of vocational education and training, and they're in every state. And then you have uh, quite commonly these days, a lot of universities now have a separate college. Um, attached to them, which is their lower level qualifications. So these certificate type programs, which are delivered as part of the um, college or the university um, divisions uh, pathways into a higher ed qualification. So you might come in and do a diploma through their college, which then can get you a credit um, towards a um, degree. For each of these different providers, they each have their own uh, peak bodies who represent them and will work with them to make sure that their needs are um, uh, sought through government and are able to be um, ensuring that they have good support from government policy in a lot of cases. So again, you can click on any of the different links here and it will take you through to more information on those. So then we come down to this final section here called VET System Drivers and Enablers. So these are all the largely government departments that facilitate um, an industry which is quite a, um, of a large size um, as the VET sector is. So this section here is really the beginning of how um, a training package or a qualification has come to be. So it starts with an organisation that's called the Australian Industry and Skills Committee. So when you click on the link, you come through to this web page. So this one particularly is um, the government organisation that deals with each of the different state authorities for education. They all come together at a, what's called a COAG meeting. 
and it's all on different topics, not just education, but they'll come together and talk about energy and, you know, various different topics. So part of their brief, though, is to look at what is required. And this organisation, the Australian Industry and Skills Committee, is established to make sure that there is a voice from industry to talk to these um, state and federal representatives for education. So as part of that, they work with things called in things or bodies called industry reference committees. So an industry reference committee is an organisation that represents an industry. So if you work in a particular um, industry and you know that there is new technology coming down the chute that supports your industry and you want to have changes to the training package that um, supports you, then um, you can get representation um, through these industry reference committees to then formally take up the case with government to be able to um, develop training packages or to change existing ones. And then they work with organisations called um, skills service organisations. So these are the SSOs. So there's six of those and these are the six organisations that are given a government contract to be able to write the actual training package together after the consultation has occurred with industry. So each of the six has their own website and tells you what industries they look after. So one of the six is called PWC's Skills for Australia and these are all the different industries that they are responsible for writing the training package um, for. They develop and review training packages for all these different industries. So for example, education is the one that, um, that we're part of now doing a TAE. So in their industry reference committee for education, they work with all these real people who are part of the um, industry reference committee that informs government about the needs from an education perspective. So you can go back to the um, service skills page um, and you can look up each of the six and see what different industries they cover. And that will then tell you which one your particular industry might be most related to. Depends on what your industry is. So again, it's all very hyperlinked on there. So once you've worked out which one your particular industry might be, you can then um, work with them if you have particular needs that you believe need to be um, addressed within your industry on the, the topic of training and what might need to be added to a training package on that one. So that's the um, AISC, Australian Industry and Skills Committee website. So again, it's quite an important one on that topic there. So then once we've actually been through um, a bit about who's who in the zoo, there's a couple of other main players that I think are important to um, discuss as part of your knowledge about the background when it comes to um, the vet sector. So the one that we mentioned previously was the AQF. So AQF stands for the Australian Qualifications Framework. Again, it's another site that I'd recommend bookmarking because quite often you'll refer back to that. On the um, homepage of the AQF website, there's actually a download link which gives you a document called the Australian Qualifications Framework. It's got 112 pages, but it gives you, I guess, a broad overview of what each of the different qualifications are and what, um, what the expectations would be at these different levels. So you come to a little summary table let me just get down to that page there. So a certificate one, for example, it will give you a summary that explains what the expectations are of someone in the education um, field who's putting together something at level one. So AQF level one is certificate one, AQF level two is certificate two and so on. So essentially it tells you a bit of a descriptor about what graduates at that level should be expected to be doing. And then it gives you some further information. It gives you information about the length of the course itself and what it typically will normally take for someone who doesn't already hold skills and knowledge. So the AQF document is quite an important one and it certainly gives you lots and lots of information um, about what the different um, areas are within the AQF and how they can be supporting. There's actually a summary table where it takes you through from senior certificate. 
through level one and you can kind of see them side by side. So when you look at the graduates information, it will tell you, um, you know, just a brief overview that says that people at this level are having limited autonomy, for example, versus the next level up, they're able to adapt and transfer skills, but only within known routines, methods and context. So it just gives you a bit of an expectation as to what um, you should be um, seeing come through when you've got a graduate at Sur 3 level versus someone when you come down to these higher levels, it will give you that higher expectation about um, someone who's um, performing at that level. So at Cert 4 level, this is a, the level of the Certificate for in Training and Assessment. It's um, essentially for individuals who apply a broad range of specialised knowledge and skills in varied contexts. So it's also a pathway for further learning. So it's really starting to get more specialised, which is different to something at a Cert 3 level where you're kind of being very um, repetitive in what you're doing and you're not really going too much outside the square on that one. So then um, if we move along, the next one that I'd like to um, share with you, the, the next website is the training.gov, sorry, is the um, uh, RTO standards, which is part of this um, governing body, which is the Australian Skills Quality Authority. So this is called commonly ASQA. So ASQA is like the ASIC um, is for business. So ASIC is the regulator of businesses in Australia versus ASQA, which is the regulator of RTOs. So every RTO, when they are given their accreditation, they agree to abide by certain standards that are legislated. And certainly within um, the ASQA website, you can download this user's guide for standards of RTOs, which was implemented back in 2015. So it's quite an extensive document. Um, there's eight different standards. They break it down into six different chapters. So initially you're talking about marketing and recruitment. So they have standards in place to make sure that people are not recruited into programs that are not suitable for them, or they're not recruited into programs without full information being given up front, that their individual Needs are then being addressed when they go through that enrolment phase. So they, uh, you're not setting someone up to fail with a training program. Then there is sufficient support um, through the progression of the training program that there is quality practice around the training and assessment for students and that when they get completed, they get given their proper certification and that all the compliance and government governance practice happens. So there's annual reports and various data submissions that have to occur when you're an RTO. So again, this is a website that I would suggest bookmarking. You can go into this one where it's got this um, user's guide if you would like further information. The main area that it does apply to those doing the TAE is within standards um, 1.14 and 1.15 and also in Schedule 1 is that there's very specific requirements for trainers and assessors. So if your role in the vet sector is um, to be a trainer assessor, you'll have certain responsibilities once you've completed your TAE and you're starting work in this area that you must hold the required credentials. So currently, according to the standards, you must hold as a minimum a certificate for in training and assessment, so a TAE 40116, or you can hold the old TAE 40110, which came out in 2010, but there are two new units of competency that are now core units of the revised 2016 version that you must have um, completed, and that was um, as at June of this year. So you must also hold vocational competencies. So that means that if you're delivering on a particular topic, you have to demonstrate that you have um, definitely um, got the expertise to be able to be doing that and that you've got industry skill. So it's not good enough that you've just read a textbook on a topic and you think you know all about it. You've got to show that you've got industry currency 
um, and have very current knowledge and skills on the topic that you're going to be training in and that you've got a commitment to undertaking professional development for both your trainer assessor skills and also your industry um, currency and knowledge. With the required credentials, um, if you do choose to continue your learning and development on the TAE topic, you can also hold a diploma. So where it says required credentials here, it is a certificate for in training and assessment or a higher qualification in adult education on that one. So then the next um, website that we're going to have a look at is one called training.gov.au, often, often referred to as TGA, and that's the website there. So this is a database of all training components and all organisations that are accredited to deliver them. And I guess the reason why there is um, consistency around training packages um, across the nation. So if you're in Victoria or Northern Territory or wherever you might be based as either an employer or as a student, the, you want to know that someone doing a Certificate 3 in business is going to be expected to achieve the same standard no matter where they are. And that's really the reason why they have these nationally accredited um, qualifications. So we'll just go and have a look at the training.gov.au website. Okay, so um, just make sure when you are putting in your URL, you put forward slash search on the end. If you don't, um, you'll likely come up with a website that looks like that. So just click on the National Register of VET and click on that search button over there and it will take you back to the same area pretty much. So from that search, field up here on the navigation bar, you can see there are two separate areas that we're talking about that you can do searches on. So one is called training components and one is called a registered training organisation. So we'll look at the RTO one first, but then we'll come back and have a look at the training components. So if you're looking to find a particular training organisation, so just say you want to see um, where TAFE might be located, you can just do a keyword, you can do a search by name, or you can also search by scope. So the word scope is really based on um, uh, the list of courses or training packages or programs that the registered training organisation is able to deliver. So not every training organisation will deliver every single training package component that's available out there. They'll normally just specialise in certain things. So just say we wanted to find a list of all the TAE um, RTOs in Queensland, we could put in the code and we could tick the box and then it will do a database search to find out who they are. So it's just thinking at the moment. So then it gives you a list of all the different webs, um, uh, listings of accreditation. So there are currently 74 registered training organisations just in Queensland that can deliver the certificate for in training and assessment. Now, when you consider, oh, there's probably about 4,200 registered training organisations nationwide, you can see it's quite a small number that just offer that particular program. But you can certainly see um, where they're listed and where they have um, registration for. So let's have a look at the listing for TAFE Queensland. So on their training.gov.au page, they'll give you their legal name and their trading name and some RTOs will have multiple business names perhaps that they're marketing under. It tells you the RTO type. So remember we talked about government um, RTOs versus private ones and it gives you their main um, website. It tells you their period of registration. So they're undergoing a registration change at the moment by the looks, because that's October 2019. It'll tell you who the main contacts are and where they're located for any inquiries. Then it gives you this tab called Scope, and that will show you um, what different programs they offer. So TAFE Queensland offers 498 different qualifications. Wow, that's a lot. 
that are available to be done through their organisation. So there's pages and pages and pages of different things. Not all of them are for every state. So some of them are only for Queensland, for example. So a Certificate 3 in Animal Studies, you can only do that in Queensland if you're registered with TAFE. And similarly, some of them are nationwide. So the Cert 4 in Vet Nursing, you can do that in any state in Australia and it can be um, delivered by um, TAFE Queensland. So that's just a really quick little snapshot that shows you the summary information that you can get from that particular search area. So just say um, your specialty area is, um, might be project management for example. If you know the code for a project management program, we'll just say it's first aid and you wanted to find all the RTOs that could deliver a first aid um, program. You, oops, sorry, let me just do a new search. Sorry, we have to have a look at by scope. So just say you're wanting to get work as a trainer assessor who teaches first aid. So, and you're based in um, Tasmania, for example, you can, um, oops, I just untick the ones that are not unregistered. So you want to make sure that they're registered currently. So again, you can pick a particular qualification and then go looking for the registered training organisations that deliver that. So nobody in Tassie appears to have that one, but you can certainly um, look for different programs. Let me see if there's that example. Maybe there isn't too many. RTOs in Tassie. So certainly you can, if you've got a specialty area, you know what the qualification code is, you can go and do a search to find who the registered training organisations are that you might like to apply to um, be a contract trainer with. It's just a bit slow there coming up with our list. Okay, so if the TAE qualification was your specialty area. You could see there's 72 different organisations that offer that in Tasmania and you can get a complete list of those and then perhaps apply to them to see if um, you can obtain contract training work. So that's the RTO search. The other area is the nationally recognised training components. So when we use this phrase training components, we're basically saying training packages, qualifications, accredited courses, units of competency and skill sets. So these are all different things, um, components that make up the VET sector in terms of outcomes. So these are all different um, uh, information about particular qualifications, etc., that you're able to search under. So first, what I'll probably do is just show you a list of all the current training packages. Now, the good thing about training.gov.au is that it does give you lots and lots of information um, about historical programs that are superseded. So just say you had a student come in um, who says, I've already done that qualification, and they give you a copy of it, and it's the old version, so it's no longer current. You can look up the details of the superseded version to see what the differences are and sometimes it's just a matter of them doing some gap training to obtain the new qualification instead of having to start from scratch and do everything from scratch. So let's just search for training packages. So currently as at today there are 57 different training packages. So you can see they cover all sorts of different vocational education vocational industry topics. So really, if there's a job out there that someone is doing that's not a professional job that would be done through a university degree, there's typically going to be a training package that sits behind it. And in some cases, you can see there's a transition happening. So um, this 2007 version of the property services training package is currently being transferred into this new version here. So once you know what particular topic it is that your industry is involved in, you can then look for the detail that sits behind the training package related to your industry. So we might just have a look at the creative arts and culture training package. So to access that, you just click on the hyperlink here and it will drill down into the actual training package itself. 
So I kind of like to think of it as there being 57 filing cabinets all lined up along the wall. And within each of the filing cabinets, there'll be um, information found on training.gov that tells you what they have inside it. So you can see in this um, creative skills training package, it runs from a certificate one level all the way through to an advanced diploma level. So that's from level one through to level six on our AQF levels. And you can see all the different types of qualifications that sit within the training package, for example. So when you start at certificate one and two, these are really your foundation skills that are just giving you the basics about working within the industry. Then when you start to move into certificate three and above, you start to see specialisations happening. So for example, in the community, um, in the cultural sector, you've got screen and media, you've got dance teaching, you've got live production, you've got indigenous cultural arts, you know, design and broadcast technology. So at this point here, you start to see people being able to do qualifications that support them moving into specialty areas within your main creative arts and culture industry. And then obviously they, that continues on right up until this advanced diploma level. So we'll come back and have a look inside one of these qualifications in a moment. But then down underneath here, it has this other heading called skill sets. So a skill set is just a little sub um, um, combination of topics that doesn't involve doing a whole qualification. So if you go to do a diploma of music industry and you go into that, you can see that this diploma requires you to do 16 different topics. So a unit of competency is a topic and you've got lists of what those different topics are that you have to do. When you look at skill sets, it's going to give you just a small number. So if you, if you want to be a music tutor, you don't want to do a full diploma, you just want to be a music tutor, then you've only got to do four different um, topics to be able to then receive a skill set in being a music tutor different to being a qualification where you've got to do the full 16 or 18 units, for example. So that's what a skill set is. And then underneath the skill set section is one headed units of competency. So these are all the different topics. So within this training package itself, you can see there's 698 different topics. So these are all the different units of competency that you could be doing as part of the different qualifications. So if you have a very, very specific um, requirement to produce ceramics, then you can have a look at what's involved in that particular um, topic of producing ceramics. So if we have a look inside a unit of competency, we'll just look at the ceramics one. Again, it drills down directly from the little hyperlink and it's very, very similar in layout to the training package, except this is just a particular topic called um, produce ceramics, but this is our unit of competency. So these are the building blocks. So back to our analogy of the filing cabinets, you've got your 59 filing cabinets, one for each different industry. And then within each filing cabinet, you'll have drawers that relate to your particular qualifications. And then within each drawer, you'll have hanging files for the units of competency or the particular topics that go together to make up a qualification. So this particular topic of producing ceramics is found within two different qualifications within this training package of creative arts. So if you're doing a Cert 3 in visual arts or a Cert 3 in Indigenous and Torres Strait Islander arts, then this um, unit of competency is an option within those. So within each of these training.gov.au pages, you'll see very similar content. So you have a nice summary that explains when the pro, when this particular unit of competency came to life. So that was in 2016. You can see that there's been two updates since it was released. So one was kind of the day after by the looks, or it may have just been that version one. And then again, in February of 2019, there was an update. And it will often tell you 
what the details are of um, what was different between the old and the new and I'll show you a little link for how to do that. Then we have these companion volumes and these are produced by the service skills organisation. So remember I mentioned there were certain organisations that developed the training packages then they are responsible for putting together these implementation details so that's what the companion volumes is all about and it also gives you information about assessment requirements. Then there's a very handy link on how to find which registered training organisations are able to, they're already accredited for this particular unit. So certainly again if you're trying to find a training organisation to work with to deliver, just say your specialty was producing ceramics and you wanted to teach others how to do that, you could hunt through the list of RTOs to see if there's any that might um, have a need for your services as a trainer assessor. So the training package, it just summarises which training package it comes out of and then it tells you which qualifications it comes out of as well. Then there's a government identifier which um, gives you a classification that can be used for reporting more from a government perspective. So if they wanted to know how many people were doing units of competency related to craft, then they would um, make sure that they were um, receiving the code correctly when people were enrolled in this particular program. Then it comes up to um, content about the unit of competency. So it has the unit of competency information, then it has assessment requirements. Now these are also duplicated under here, so I'm not going to open these documents up, but if you wanted to um, have access to a document you can just download to your computer, you would download either of these, but the same information appears below. There's also this very handy comparison um, tool. So again up here I think we mentioned that we had a change, a new release happen in February of 2019 for this unit. If you wanted to know what the differences were between the prior version and the current version you could click on that compare tool there and it will show you what the differences are. Again it gives you some modification history and then it gives you what's called the application information which is a very sim simple summary of who this particular unit is aimed at and what, what the content is that's going to be covered. So it more or less says that it applies to individuals who are still developing their expertise in design and technique and that they may work under supervision but have some independence um, within defined guidelines. So you can see that it's probably quite a low level unit of competency, um, particularly because it's coming out of a certificate three level qualification. So it's um, highly likely to be an AQF three level um, uh, qualification that someone is doing when they're completing this unit of competency. So then it talks about the unit sector and then these very important bits of information here about the elements and performance criteria. So every unit of competency will have these and this is really the um, generic expectation of what competence looks like when you're assessing somebody. You have to make sure that they're able to achieve these particular outcomes. So for someone to be competent in this unit, you have to have evidence that they can plan ceramic work through exploration, they can prepare, maintain and store ceramic making resources and they can create ceramic, finished ceramic works. So that's really like the big picture outcomes that you're expecting someone will be able to do by the end of this course, you'll be able to do these three things. Then it has this other section here called performance criteria. So not dissimilar to when you apply for a job and they have a selection criteria that will nominate um, for someone to be successful in this particular um, role, they must be able to do X, Y and Z. This is the same here. So for someone to be deemed competent, they as part of planning their ceramic work must be able to explore ideas and techniques for their own ceramic work with key people. They must be able to look at different ideas from history and contemporary practice. So these are all defined as different criteria that someone must be able to demonstrate they can do to be able to be deemed competent in this unit of competency. 
Then we have a table here called foundation skills. So these are the skills that are slightly different to our performance criteria. So these ones here are very topic specific. So they're connected to the craft of ceramics. Whereas down here, foundation skills I like to describe as being the additional soft skills that you need to be able to function in a workplace. So it's made up of two parts. Firstly, it's your language literacy and numeracy components. So things like reading, writing and oral communication and numeracy are skills, LLM skills, that you would need to have to a certain level to be able to function effectively in a workplace doing these particular tasks that are listed up here. And then you've got these other ones here that they describe as employment skills. Previously, they used to be called employability skills. And these are really the other soft skills that are required for someone to be able to, again, achieve these tasks listed up here, but they must be um, able to demonstrate they can navigate the world of work or they can interact with others to get the job done. So some people um, can have really, really high level technical skills and knowledge about a topic, but they can't interact with others successfully or they um, don't have great time management about getting the job done or something like that. So it really just summarises these particular skills that are also needed as well as the technical skills of the topic that to be job ready, and I think the VET sector is all about making sure that students are job ready to do the job. These are all the additional foundation skills that are required to um, be able to complete these different performance criteria above. So if you look at reading, for example, it says it relates to performance criteria 1.2. And if we look at 1.2, it says that um, you must be able to review historical and contemporary ceramic practice. So that's involving a bit of research by the sounds of it. So if you can't read, you would really struggle to do performance criteria 1.2. So again, you don't want to set someone up to fail if they're doing the program um, around the ceramic topic. So you would need to make sure that people coming into the program do have a certain level of reading and writing and oral communication skills and numeracy, etc. Right, then down here in the second part of the unit of competency, it talks about the assessment requirements. So this is the process which typically happens at the end after the learning has been achieved, where you put someone through a formal process of evaluation, which is what assessment is all about. So can someone demonstrate they are competent in this topic, yes or no? And often within the VET sector, there's a lot of flexibility about how you determine that um, outcome, but you do have to have very solid evidence so that um, you can always defend what your, how you've made the judgment that someone is um, able to demonstrate competency. So in here, assessment requirements are broken down into three parts. The first bit that we normally look at before the others is assessment conditions. And this will give us any non-negotiable requirements of the assessment process. So it's saying that assessment must be conducted in a safe environment and that evidence is gathered consistent to typical activities experienced in the creative arts environment. So what they're saying here in that global sort of statement is that you're not asking them to do something that isn't a typical activity within a creative arts environment related to ceramics and that the environment must include access to equipment, tools and materials to produce ceramic work. So they have to physically produce something and that there is relevant information sources available to them. So that will relate to things like that research and stuff that we noted above. So it gives us a couple of clues here in that we must, it's not enough for someone to say, write a written assessment on how to do ceramics, they have to actually produce ceramic work. And therefore, they, the registered training organisation must have the equipment, tools and materials to physically produce something. So that can have a few different implications. Firstly, the RTO must have expertise internally to know what the you know, standard equipment, tools and materials are. They must have the finances to be able to buy them 
or they must notify the student that the student has to supply them if that's an option as well. So it can work lots of different ways, but very important that during the, the point of assessment, there must be evidence that there is correct equipment, tools and materials used. Then up here, we've got these two sections. One is called performance evidence and one is called knowledge evidence. So one of the big um, uh, sort of, I guess, summaries about the um, the way that the vocational education system differs a lot sometimes from the school and the higher ed system is through a process called competency-based assessment. And that's really just saying that it's not enough for you to tell me that you know the topic inside out, you must show me. So that's really about this competency-based assessment and that you must also demonstrate these additional foundation skills. So again, if you can't navigate the world of work or interact with others or get the work done, then you can't necessarily be deemed as competent because they're important factors in being job ready to do the particular topic that you've chosen. So when it comes to knowledge evidence, it gives you a nice um, specific list. These are all the things that you must have evidence that your candidate knows. So your candidate must be able to outline basic intellectual property considerations about ceramic work. They must be able to outline methods of exploring techniques to achieve different effects. So if they can't explain those topics, for example, then they're not yet competent. So they're still in the, the process of learning all these different things that they have to learn. And then secondary, we have these performance evidence items. So this is the doing part. So the knowledge is the underpinning foundation information that people must know to be competent. And then here, when we say performance evidence, we're talking about people's ability. So this is where they show you things. And it says they must have evidence of the ability to explore ideas, techniques, and historical and contemporary practice and choose techniques to support own work. They must be able to identify and acquire resources to complete the work. They must be able to adapt and use combined ceramic techniques to create a single major work or multiple pieces of work that show this proficiency in the technique and then they've got to review and document the process. So when you're putting together the assessment practice that sits behind being able to demonstrate someone is competent in this particular topic, you would effectively have a project where they have to create at least a single major work or they could do multiple pieces and they have to initially explore um, different ideas that talk about why they want to do something a certain way and they would have to then um, put together information about what resources would be required to support that outcome and then actually make the single major piece. And then they have to do some sort of reflection or review at the end. So you can see the performance evidence will often reflect what really happens in the real world. And that's the whole idea of these units of competency is that they're supposed to show you that by the time someone has finished the learning and then completed the assessment side of things for each of these topics or units of competency, that they could go and actually do um, activities in the real world, in a real ceramic um, development environment or something like that. So that's the inside out of a unit of competency and we'll do a bit of a summary about what those components are shortly. Okay, so the main reason why we have training.gov.au is again to make sure there is absolute consistency across the nation. So that's why they're called nationally recognised training components. The last one that I will mention is um, accredited courses. So we've looked at training packages. They're the major um, filing cabinet that contains all the qualifications, which are all your certificate one, two, three, four, etc. Then we've looked at units of competency and we've looked at skill sets, which are a combination of just a small number of units of competency. But there's also a thing called accredited courses and we'll just very quickly have a look at what they're all about. So when you go back to your search for training components, if we go to the accredited courses option, so there's 693 of these accredited courses 
available nationally. And the main difference with these ones is that these um, accredited courses have been developed by individuals or organisations separate to the government. So all of the other 59 training packages that we just scanned over, they're all um, developed in conjunction with the government, funded by the government to pay for the SSO to put them together. They're informed by industry saying we have a need for those particular topics and that's how they kind of get born. Accredited courses are different. These are, um, I guess, more niche topics where they're not, the topic is not currently being covered through any other training package. And an individual or organisation external to the government, um, although sometimes government departments do um, own these accredited courses, will come up with the concept saying there is a market for people to learn something new and I'm going to put together the actual qualification and I'm going to own the IP that sits behind that. So a good example of this is blockchain. So cryptocurrency is quite topical. There's a lot of activity happening um, in, I guess, the financial sectors where they're starting to put together things to do with cryptocurrency. So a particular individual has put together an advanced diploma of applied blockchain. And that's so that um, people who have an interest in cryptocurrency and maybe want to take that on as a, um, as a um, vocation down the track, are able to do this particular advanced diploma of blockchain. Now, it's not available to every um, RTO automatically to put on their scope. They have to apply to the actual owner of the course. So that is this particular gentleman here. So his organisation um, de decided there was a need for this blockchain advanced diploma to be put together. So he would have gone about the process of writing the program from scratch. So he would work out how many units, what the topics are, all that kind of stuff. And there's a list of what these topics are here. So there's 10 different topics and you can see them there. But if you click on any of these particular units, it doesn't give you the details. Like you don't see all the performance criteria and the assessment requirements. To get that information, you would have to go back to the owner of the actual um, qualification. So the IP for this particular one is owned by this individual. Um, and if you wanted to see which RTOs had been accredited to deliver it, again, same sort of link. So there's two different um, RTOs that are able to offer that particular program. And um, you could, if you were a student who had interest in blockchain technology, you could apply to either of them to see what the details were to do their, their version of the advanced diploma of applied blockchain. But if you were an RTO, you would have to go to the um, intellectual property owner to get permission to offer it and to put it onto your scope. And they may or may not allow you to. They may have a license fee. So again, um, it's really just for these very, very niche technologies or these niche topics that are not currently being covered by one of those 59 mainstream qualifications. So you can see there's lots of different topics in here. Um, a lot of them are um, specific to people's, uh, people have developed a certain amount of um, intellectual property about a certain subject themselves through their life's work. So, you know, you'll find topics in here you may never have heard of before. But things like cosmetic dermal science, um, you know, obviously very, very topical and they're within the health training package. They're obviously not covering anything on cosmetic dermal science so far. But they doesn't mean they won't change it down the track. There's also different generic ones around performing arts that would be using a particular technology, I'm sure. So there's yoga, there's all sorts of different things. So you can see there's 693 individuals or organisations who've decided that there's particular programs that are not being covered by existing training packages and they would like to offer them. So they've developed them. They pay a fee to the government to have it um, registered and then they can either find RTOs to deliver it on their behalf or they can be the sole RTO that delivers it on their behalf. So that's it for our training components. So these are all the different ones here. Again, if you wanted to look up what the previous version of a training package um, information was, 
you can ask to have the superseded data included and that would um, obviously give you the older version of everything so you can do a comparison on that. Okay, so we've talked about those components within a unit of competency. And I guess just to kind of summarise and bring it all together, when a learning program is put together, you have certain benchmarks to be met to show that someone is meeting the standard and they're job ready. So firstly, we had a look at our units of competency and the performance criteria and the assessment requirements that formed part of the unit of competency. Then on top of it, we normally have to look at whether or not there's any particular standards within industry that you have to meet as well as a benchmark. And then you may also have organisational standards. So a good example of this, and I'll just quickly flip back to training.gov and we'll have a look at one. So if we have a look at first aid or CPR or one of those particular units, um, I think there's one there. Oops. Let me just find that. Okay, so this is provide CPR. So this is a very common unit. A lot of people do it. All different industries often require this for their employees to do. Again, you can see which training packages it comes out of. So there's quite a few of those. It's also pulled into a few accredited courses. And there's about 84 different qualifications that stipulate CPR as being a topic of value. And similarly, there's 12 skill sets. So when you come down to the assessment requirements for this CPR unit, where it's talking about the performance evidence, so this is the show me that you can do CPR part. Firstly, it talks about um, there must be evidence the candidate has completed the following tasks in line with state or territory regulations. And it doesn't tell you what they are. So you have to go and look up if you're if you're in Queensland delivering this unit, it may have slight different requirements to if you're in um, WA, for example. You need to look up the first aid code of practice and you also have to reference the ARC guidelines. But it also talks about workplace procedures. So if you were teaching CPR, you would have to look at all of those different um, requirements to know what you're teaching. So the ARC guidelines, the Australian Resource Council guidelines, often change. So they may change the variation between breaths to, um, to compressions, for example. So instead of the whole unit having to be changed, they just say, make sure that you're doing it how the ARC wants it but also they're saying do it how the organisation wants it. So certain um, employers may require a certain um, practical task to be done to know that people can provide CPR in their particular workplace. So if you're working for an organisation that um, deals with children, you may, um, or you know, infants even, you may have different assessment tasks because the employer that, um, that you're teaching students to do CPR for uh, would have a higher likelihood perhaps of doing CPR on infants or children versus if you're teaching CPR in an aged care facility, you may be having your assessment um, requirements more reflective of dealing with, say, geriatrics that may need CPR. So even though you've got a very standard unit of competency, it's not just about these performance criteria here because an emergency situation in a childcare centre would be different to an emergency situation in an aged care facility. So it's not enough just to say that you've met these generic performance criteria. You must also make sure that you're picking up on any requirements from a workplace, but also from these other guidelines that are given by different authorities. And when you read units of competency, you'll often see this sort of stuff um, quoted. So when we come back to our summary about what are the different um, other standards that have to be taken into account, obviously you've got your unit of competency, you've got your industry generally, 
which could be different state to state and you've then got your organisational standards. So how we kind of pull all this together then is that we've got our training package which informs us this generic information and it may refer us to look up what the standards and the organisational requirements are. So we then put together what's called a training and assessment strategy. So it's commonly called a TAS. So it's really a high level document that gives a really clear indication of what our intentions are about training and assessing that topic. So if we go back to that CPR example, we can easily grab our unit of competency requirements, but we would have to know who is the student going to be in what industry are they likely to be part of and are they part of a specific organisation that would have their own standards. So all of this information then gets put into a training and assessment strategy where we will say, you know, who's the learner, what existing skills and knowledge do they have, what industry are they working for, what's the outcomes of the program, um, you know, what equipment do they need to use because it may differ depending upon what industry or organisational standards are and all those sorts of things. Then once we've got this high level document put in place, we then prepare the training program. And that's like the more micro details that sits beneath the higher level intention. So that will be more detail around how we're going to deliver the training and how we're going to specifically schedule it, who's going to be um, responsible for certain parts of it. So it really just gives us that secondary requirement around the training, but more of a micro detail. So this is more of a high level intention. We can also get information around industry standards from industry websites, and then our organisational standards can come from the policy procedures or training resources already in place for the um, individual organisation. So if we summarise what goes into a training and assessment strategy or a TAS, there is a government website reference again. So I'll just flip over to that. But on the screen here, you can see all the different headings that must be captured as part of a training and assessment strategy. So firstly, you have to cover the training product. So it's really important that you know what the qualification code is and the qualification name, or it could just be an individual unit like CPR, or it could be a skill set, or it could be an accredited course. So whatever the training product is that you've um, discovered on training.gov.au, it must be very clearly identified in the training and assessment strategy. Then you have to talk about what are the core and elective components if it's a full qualification. So if we go back to training.gov again, so this CPR unit we said comes out of quite a few different qualifications. So there's 84 that have this particular topic in here. So let's just see if we can find one that's not too complex. I'm just going to try and look for a simple one. Okay. So if we look at this one, for example, um, a certificate three in health service assistance. So this is people that work in various different health environments um, where they're becoming, they're like an assistant to somebody else within a health environment. So if we go down here to a section called packaging rules, it will tell us how many units of competency we must do if we're aiming to get the full certificate three in health service assistance. So when we come down here, we can see that the total number of units required to complete the qualification is 15. So if you do 14, you haven't finished. If you do 16, you've done one too many. And that there are seven core units so that's important because these core units here, which are listed very clearly, are non-negotiable. So if you said, oh, I don't think they're really going to work with diverse people, too bad. You have to still do that particular unit of competency or topic because they may change job tomorrow and go work with a different organisation in the health sector that does have um, a diverse client base or workforce. 
So these core units are non-negotiable, so you can find a list of those at the um, in the packaging rules section for a qualification. Then it says eight elective units. At least six of these electives must be from the list below. So underneath here, you can see all these different elective options and you've got to pick six of them. So again, they are broken down into different specialty areas. So if you were going to be a health assistant working in an operating theatre as a technician, these are the ones that you should do. If you're going to work in a nursing, um, an acute care nursing environment, these are ones you would pick from. Then you have these other more generic ones, which are more to do with specific topics. So if the qualification that you're looking to do doesn't involve people that are bedridden, perhaps and involve a lot of beds, you may not need to do something to do with preparing and maintaining beds. So if you were doing a health assistant role where you were just going out and educating people, then you wouldn't necessarily need to maintain beds. But you may need to um, engage with health professionals in the health system or you might be working with migrants or you might not. So again you can see um, how there's lots and lots of different options when it comes to what topics you pull in together when you're doing an actual qualification design. And I think that's why they call it instructional design is that you get to design um, exactly the combination of units that you choose based on the packaging rules that are listed in the unit of competency. So where it's got eight electives and six of them have to be from the list below, it also says that up to two can be taken from any training package. Remember there's 59 different training packages or accredited course, provided they're relevant to the outcome. And it's saying electives chosen must contribute to a valid industry supported vocational outcome. So you can't just pick any two randoms that have nothing to do with the vocation. And it says any combination of electives that meet the rules can be selected for the award Cert 3 in health services where appropriate and that they can be packaged to provide a qualification with a specialisation. So sometimes when you get these instructions in packaging rules, it will say it must be at a certain AQF level or above. So it might say um, units that are at um, AQF 3 or above or something like that. This one doesn't say that. So it more or less just says that it, it means that you must be making sure that whatever the topics are relate to the job that the person is ultimately going to be heading towards. So for example, if you were working in a health environment, but you were being asked to do, say, more of the education work, so just say you worked for a not uh, an NGO and you were going out to educate people on topics, you might pull in some education units. Or if you're doing more admin, you might pull in admin units. Or if you're doing marketing, you might pull in marketing units. So they would come from a different training package. So these ones here are largely CHC for community services or HLT for health services. Um, whereas you might look for some of these BSB ones, which are more to do with the admin side of things. So something very generic like organised personal work priorities is quite a generic unit, but very important for lots of different work environments in different industries. So this is what we call packaging rules. So if we go back to our training and assessment strategy, it says that you must be very, very clear about what are the core and what are the elective components if you're doing a full qualification. Whoops. And then it talks about the target group. So it says again, you must clearly identify the target group and what their characteristics are. So are these students school leavers? Are they older people returning to the workforce? Are they distance students or are they going to come to a classroom? Do they require a recognition of prior learning strategy? So do they hold some skills or knowledge already? So really you can just put any sort of description based on what your intention is around who the target group might be that your training program is being put together for. 
Then they want to know about the mode of delivery. So how are you going to do your training and assessment? Is it face to face in a classroom? Is it online? Is it for people that are employed in a workplace or are you going to do a combination of all of that? Then it's important to know any entry requirements. So do they have to have a certain amount of existing um, experience or skills and knowledge? Um, do they need to have a certain level of language literacy and numeracy? You know how we looked at the foundation skills previously. Do they have to have certain physical attributes? If it's a very physically demanding job like heavy lifting, then people just need to know before they make the decision to do your training program what the requirements are going to be. Then it's important to look at the duration and scheduling. So how long is the course going to be run for? Um, is it once a week, once a month? What are the, what's the kind of structure of the duration and how is it going to be scheduled? Then you have to outline what the assessment, resources, methods and timing are going to be all about. So that could be um, what equipment is going to be needed, um, where is, where are the, uh, what's the timing of the assessments, anything like that. And similarly with your learning resources. So do you have a textbook? Do you have PowerPoints or do you have certain learner guides that your students will be using? So all of this stuff has to be in place and documented before you're permitted to apply to add a different, a new program, for example, to your scope. Human resources, so this is really who are the subject matter experts that hold a TAE and are current to industry standards with their skills and knowledge, who are those people that are going to deliver the training through the training organisation? What other physical resources might be needed, equipment or materials? And then they've got two separate ones. One is for standalone units. So if you were just delivering CPR and nothing else, you could have a training and assessment strategy just for one unit. Or they've got this other option, which is assessment only pathways. So if you've got people who are wanting to get a certificate outcome, but they already hold the skills and knowledge, you could just have an assessment only pathway where either they just go and do the assessment only, or they have evidence under recognition of prior learning to be able to be deemed competent. So all of these items are typically headings that you'll find in a standard training and assessment strategy so that anyone uh, can pick up your training and assessment strategy and know exactly what your intentions are regarding um, how the program's going to be run. I guess as part of that then it's very important to understand what the purposes are for what the training is going to fulfill. So there's lots and lots of different purposes. If you think um, of all the different training programs you may have done yourself, they'll be for a whole variety of different reasons. So it could be refreshing or updating your existing skills, um, developing new skills if you're moving into a new area or there's new technology coming into a workplace. It could be standard professional development where you're exploring additional information around topics that you're currently familiar with to expand your knowledge. You might be needing to get an actual vocational competency like a certificate or a um, CPR is often a good one there. So often in organisations will require you to do first aid and CPR every 12 months. It may be for people who need to develop their LLN. So if you were a migrant coming in from overseas, you might need to develop some of your language literacy and numeracy and do training to support that. Could be about licensing or legislative requirements. So some jobs, um, you're required to actually hold a certain qualification before you can take on that work, like bookkeeping, for example. And then um, it could be um, to address some sort of corrective action. So if something... Uh, is causing problems in the workplace, they may, uh, the organisation may determine that training is required so that everyone knows what the correct way to do something is and they may run training to make sure that people are doing um, processes the correct way. When it comes to finding learning resources, there's lots of different opportunities. Again, back on that um, Vet Knowledge Bank, there's a whole section on learning resources. Let me just grab that one on the screen. 
I'll just go back here. So if we just go back to our main knowledge part here, um, it has a heading here called resources and it's got a vet practitioner resources tab. So then it's, it breaks it down into different areas. So if you want to read some research on what other people are doing, you could go there. Um, or if you're teaching training and looking for some different resources, then click on the vet practitioner resource section. So if you want information that's to do with your training content and you don't have any currently within the organisation that you can amend or update, then this page here will give you lots of different information. So again, it gives you quite a few of the government websites as links. Then it has a section called free resources. So it will give you um, some links you can click on there. So if you're working in the childcare section, there's materials the government has produced, produced that you may be able to use. Then it's got some to do with your training assessment practice. And then it's got these are a list of commercial products for purchase. So if you were wanting to look at um, a particular topic, for example, um, so you could click on this one here. So see all these different training packages here. So if you're wanting to deliver something in the training and education section, you can actually buy a learner guide and it's $19 for each unit, for example. So if you were gonna run a class of 10, you would buy 10 of those and you'd be able to use these materials to, instead of having to write the materials from scratch yourself. So it would give you a full overview of what's involved and sometimes you can get samples of the materials to have a look at them before. But sometimes you might get something and then add to it to make it more relevant to your industry or your organization on that. So that vet practitioner resource list is quite helpful, but also you can Google around. Quite often you'll find content may come from an industry body. If you've got um, a particular organization that supports your industry, they may put together fact sheets or resources you can use in your training. And then if you're wanting to put together assessment tools, you can either write them yourself or you can buy them as commercial ones, but you should always quality check them to make sure they would pass audit. So again, lots and lots of different um, options there. So once you've decided what the program is that you're intending to put together, it's important to then go through your instruction design principles to ensure that you can um, put together a quality program. So the first bit is really identifying what the learning outcome is. So by the end of this training, participants will achieve X, Y, Z, and who is the target audience? So is there a particular industry focus or a particular organizational focus? So number one is to really analyze and determine why is the training needed? You don't wanna be putting together training programs for the sake of training. You wanna make sure there's a real clear purpose and an outcome there. Then there's a section which says to develop so research, develop and document the content. So this is really understanding what the learning objectives are in more specific detail, planning what the training is. Is it one day, one year? How long is it going to run? What's the schedule? And then how are you going to assess it? Then you, you start building your course. So you look for existing resources and you source anything additional that you need. And you also look at how are you going to confirm that the outcome has been met? How do you know that someone has achieved competence for the topic that you're going to be putting your training program together for? And what requirements do you have? So do they have to do a project? Do they have to do a portfolio? What's the assessment pathway needed? Then you would implement the program and usually as a trial initially, and then you do a review. So what's worked and what can be improved to be able to measure the effectiveness and the impact of the actual training itself. So I guess with your instructional design principles, you're really looking to make sure that you have nutted out the specifics of your target audience so that you are not putting together a program where you're setting them up to fail. You really want to make sure that you are writing materials that are applicable to the LLM capabilities of the group, that um, they're also um, going to be experiencing real world type assessment requirements. So you're not 
um, teaching them something and assessing them something and then they get out into the workforce and they can't really do it in the real world. So very important to understand what your outcomes are. And then you've got lots and lots of different um, options when it comes to the training method. So face-to-face -face in a classroom, that's really good for a lot of your initial underpinning knowledge. Then things like practical tasks, so don't just tell them what to do, make sure they can practice doing it. You might have a group that are not geographically close to where you are, so you might need to do an online or a distance program. You might get them to do projects or role plays or anything that sits behind um, you being able to know that they could actually then do it in the real world, uh, which could be things like a logbook or a portfolio. So people then get to practice the skills in different scenarios and learn that way. And then there's also knowledge learning by memory. So where you've got some very specific facts that people have to learn, sometimes there's no choice but to have some sort of an exam to know whether or not they can actually memorise the content. And when it comes to assessment strategies, we'll have a separate um, support session on this one. But there is a very useful guide produced by ASQA on developing quality assessment tools. So we'll come back to um, that in a separate support session, but very important um, principles and rules that sit behind what a compliant assessment tool looks like. And certainly that's important to really think through what the different types of assessment might be that you would do that would be most applicable to knowing that someone could um, demonstrate the task in the real world. So those sorts of things, those methods might involve direct observation, so you get them to actually do the task and then you observe them doing it. You might get them to produce a product. So if they're a carpenter, you might get them to produce um, you know, a piece of woodwork. If they're a ceramics person, you might get them to produce a, a particular piece of work there. There could be a portfolio, which could be a collection of pieces um, produced over time. Questioning, so again, with your knowledge assessment, you might give them a written test, you might give them a verbal test, you might have an interview or some sort of a um, other form of understanding that they hold the knowledge. And then you've got this thing called third party evidence. So that's where you're not involved directly with the um, collection of the assessment. So you might have a supervisor watch someone do something and sign an observation checklist or you might um, have someone who uh, was involved in, in doing a particular project in a workplace that can provide you with that evidence that the um, student was competent. And lastly, it's important that we don't forget the topic of WHS. So you have very strict um, requirements and usually there'll be um, very specific codes of practice by industry around safety. So it's making sure that whenever you are involved in training and assessment in a workplace or in a classroom even, that's not part of a workplace, that you are always responsible for your, the um, health and safety of your students. So you would need to have certain um, requirements in place to make sure there was no hazards or anything that was going to cause any harm. And that's it. So I guess what we'd um, recommend now is that you now, after having a look at the content, you can certainly refer to your learner guide or textbook or um, whatever other supplementary materials have been provided as part of your course and that you now review the assessment requirements that um, are associated to this content. So thank you very much for your time today. It's been great to share this information with you and certainly this is the first of a few in the series. Bye for now.